This is a conversation with Alex Kashuta of the Subversive Podcast. So Alex has had a very interesting journey. I knew her briefly when she was living in London working in media, and she describes herself then as a classic rationalist, atheist, and feminist. In the last few years, she's moved back to Romania and now describes herself more as a traditionalist and through her podcast has been exploring the post-liberal moment with some controversial thinkers. What post-liberalism sees is that, okay, if power is a constant um, and if a society will always be um, subsumed by power and by rules and by a value system, every society has a value system, um, what value system should it be? These, these are extremely complicated questions, um, you know, like I said, my, my purpose is to explore these spaces, but uh, I don't think I've, I've heard anyone that I can say, hey, this, this is the new regime. Let's just, you know, roll up our sleeve and start implementing it because it just, it just doesn't work that way. In this conversation, we talk about her recent journey and how it mirrors many others who've gone from rationalist to traditionalist and what that says about the cultural time we find ourselves in. I think uh, our cultures are kind of at that tension point between those two views of, of what it is to be human. I think the, the rational metaphor has served us really well. Um, you know, it's given us technology. Uh, it is a very limited metaphor up to a point. And I think, you know, the, the embodied uh, spiritual creature metaphor also served us very well up to a point. Uh, and I think now what we have to do is kind of balance the tension between these two metaphors and, and how we take the best out of, out of both mindsets. Hope you enjoy this conversation. Alex, welcome. Thank you for having me. So you are the host of the Subversive podcast. You are, we knew each other briefly in London, not for very long, but you've since moved to Romania for a more sort of traditionalist lifestyle. And you have been going on a really interesting journey over the last few years that I'd love to hear a little bit more about, point people in the direction of your podcast. And I think your journey certainly has a lot of relevance because there are a lot of people who, you've talked about this before, who maybe were sort of part of the rationalist community who are going in a more traditionalist direction. So I think it's something that has a lot of resonance and a lot of, um, yeah, sheds a light on a lot of the cultural dynamics we're seeing at the moment. So. Yeah, I'd like to start with like what's what's your sort of personal trajectory been, and where have you ended up? Yes, uh, there are, there are many like me. I think <laughs> there it is a path. It is a pipeline uh, at this point. Um, my personal my my ur trajectory was as someone who was kind of interested in in what was happening to the internet in I don't know mid 2000s that's kind of when i uh, i got there uh i was first uh, kind of a, a forum dweller and i think i've probably never left the forums <laughs> but uh i was uh very much into the new atheism movement uh, i was kind of relatively adjacent to to left wing politics which was kind of um high status back then especially for someone coming from eastern europe going to the universities in the west uh i studied in, in austria and then i studied in spain uh, it was the thing to study the it was interesting um i majored in diversity management, which is kind of a, a gender studies type uh, construct. Um, so that was kind of where where my origins were, very much kind of what would be uh, termed today Reddit atheism uh, with uh, feminist characteristics, as one would expect for a young woman in the mid-2000s. Uh, then I, um, I slowly kind of went into the libertarian direction uh, because the um, the the outlook of that that was set up kind of by this left leaning feminist uh, line of thinking uh, didn't play out very well. If you thought you know a bit game theoretically about it, you it it just didn't um, it didn't make a lot of sense. Uh, and then libertarianism is the next thing that people tend to gravitate towards, and I didn't I didn't miss a beat. I became kind of libertarian, um, and then I guess slowly I became interested in the politics that I'm interested in now. Um, my podcast uh, tends to be. Uh, kind of chronicling what I would probably call the kind of the post-liberal moment. It's all of the thinkers that, um, you know, some some from the left, a lot of them from the right, uh, are um, thinking about the limits uh, of liberalism, what it actually is, uh, how it's played out in the last 50, 100, 200 years. Some go back a thousand years as well, depending on who you ask. Um, and what 
may come after it, uh, if it is having, you know, a, a dying a gasp, as we, as some people uh, tend to diagnose it as right now. Yeah, so I think that is a really good place to start. The idea of the post-liberal moment, like there's a lot of really significant thinkers um, like Patrick Deneen and many other kind of best-selling books recently looking at kind of the contradictions within the liberal worldview and saying essentially it's kind of unsustainable. Um, and I know a lot of the people you feature on your podcast, the subversive podcast, have been from the kind of neo-reactionary tribe, which has been one of the sort of most critical um, groups of people towards liberalism. I'd like to maybe start by, if you could like summarize that, that kind of perspective for people who may not be familiar with it. And then we'll kind of dig in a little bit to, to that and your personal backstory. Exactly. So um, I don't necessarily, I probably wouldn't describe myself as a new reaction, but though that's probably one of my biggest influences uh, in terms of, you know, this whole, the whole post-liberal moment, a big chunk underneath it is neo reaction. Um, it's almost in a way for a very, very long time, it was almost synonymous with, with whatever we call post-liberal. It was the only critique that was kind of uh, simmering below the mainstream in the sense that a lot of people with a lot to say had read the works of Curtis Yarvin, who is the kind of the primary architect of, of Neo Reaction uh, and the, the person mostly associated with it, uh, but not many people were talking about it. So this is essentially a, a forum a uh, spreading thing. Uh, there was a um, a blog, kind of the, the most important piece of Neo Reaction canon. It's called um, um, Unqualified Reservations, uh, which is, or you are for, for people who are in the know. Um, and uh, tied into that, there was also Nick Land's work, which, uh, which is essentially a very long post called The Dark Enlightenment, uh, which links to um, Mentis Molebug's work, which is Curtis Yarvin. This is obviously the, <laughs> the, big, the big backstory, but this is kind of the, we would say probably the basic neo-reactionary canon that people tend to find. Uh, and that offers the first uh, red pill, a, a term coined by Curtis Yarvin himself, um, where these two thinkers um, kind of de deconstruct the ingredients of liberalism um, and make a, a straight line between what actually liberalism is and the dysfunctions that we're seeing nowadays and what we would say is, you know, the anti-woke movement and, and all of the stuff that we see, you know, the excesses of progressivism are essentially just a, a fulfillment of, uh, of liberalism itself. So that's essentially, this is one type of critique near reaction uh, bases itself on thinkers like uh, Joseph de Mestre or Spengler, Carl Schmidt. So, um, Burnham is a big thinker in this space. Um, there are other strands of neo reaction or uh, other strands of post liberalism. Um, like, for example, John Gray would say, we would say, would be a thinker of post liberalism from the UK. But uh, they they're not necessarily tied into neo reaction. But yeah, there are there are many thinkers, and I think one of my one of my uh, callings is to just bring these people together and you know make lists of things <laughs> to to offer to others. So. Um, I don't know if that was very clear, but um, yeah, essentially um, we are we are now gathering the fruits of a liberalism that has come to fruition, which is also essentially Patrick Deneen's thesis. Yeah, and I mean, there's a famous quote: uh, "Conservative is a liberal who's been mugged by reality." What? So, if that's the case, what is a neo-reactionary? Um, a new reactionary is a uh, conservative who's been mugged so hard that <laughs> they, they saw the, the light at the end of the tunnel. They, they've transcended conservatism, which is um, essentially, I mean, even even definitionally, it's it's conserving the status quo. I mean, if, if you are in, you know, a republic composed of, you know, pink haired SJWs and you're conserving the status quo, I mean, what exactly are you conserving? Uh, it's it does, it's not a stable um, position. It is constantly shifting leftwards if your whole it's you know a, a lot of people who say um I, I did not leave the left the left left me essentially yes you're a conservative but you're you're drifting towards the left and then at one point you say okay i'm uncomfortable with what's going on there is no principled position in that it's just oh uh me personally i would have preferred the situation from five years ago i would have preferred the liberalism in the flavor that we had in 2005 rather than the one that we had a crazy thing that we have in 2022 uh this isn't a position and i think that's uh, why a lot of people are starting to drift towards what is a position what what are the principles that um we can actually use to oppose this outside of this is crazy i don't like it uh this this has gone too far are there any principles so yeah that's that's 
kind of the space I'm trying to explore. Often I find the critiques much more useful than the suggested solutions. I, I had this conversation a little while ago with, um, with Gary Lackman, where if you look at, I don't know if you're familiar with Paul Berman's work, Terror and Liberalism from 2004, I think. He, he talked about, he actually looked at the Islamists, some of the formative Islamist thinkers like Saeed Qubd and said, his diagnosis of American society, like the hollowness of it and the kind of spiritual, the way that um, corporate interests kind of hollow out spiritual values, like is a great critique. And so many of the kind of critiques of the Western system are really valuable. But then often the solutions that are suggested, like a, a, ca a universal caliphate in the case of kind of Saeed Qubd or um, the greater Russian empire in the case of sort of Dugin or, or, or Putin, it's like, okay, the diagnosis is useful, but the solution is like, that's not going to work. That's not sufficient for the kind of the 21st century, certainly for the position we find ourselves. So I guess that's where I find myself with a lot of the neo-reactionary thought as well is like, as far as the critique goes, it seems to have a lot of validity, but then it kind of just goes off the, the rails at the last minute in their suggested kind of ways of solving things. How would yes. you say? Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is probably, you know, absolutely valid criticism um you know we we also uh, have been marinating in a in a kind of um absence of history for a very long time which also what you know the conflict in ukraine shows us now um this is a like a, a very um unusual time uh and it also gives us very unusual clues about how the world works and I feel like um, a, a, a lot of, um, you know, the, the diagnoses, uh, like you said, are good, but the prescriptions is, <laughs> is, is suspicious is because any prescription will have to enshrine a set of values because that, that is essentially the, what, what happens after liberalism. Because liberalism is the idea that we can live without a prescribed set of values, that we can have pluralism, and that different people with different value sets can live together, and that there will be no power struggle because the system is, uh, you know, it's, it's self it checks and balances, it, it clears itself out. What we're seeing right now is that, you know, you can throw power out the window, but it comes back through the door. Uh, power is is a constant in nature. And, and how it... Um, how it trickles down, how it forms, how it coagulates, it, it always, it's a constant. There will be power exerted in a system. And at the moment, the power is narrative power. You see it, you know, these, these egregores that, that uh, lead us, you know, that it doesn't even have to be uh, a leader. It can be just a, like a mimetic wave uh, that everyone needs to align themselves with because that's, you know, that's a local shelling point for X population. Um, that is power. Uh, it's not it's not located in one individual, but it, it, it is immense power and it can go haywire as we can see, you know, as essentially a, a, my podcast, a lot of, a lot of people are talking about this because they've noticed these dysfunctions of power. So the, what, what neo reaction and what post-liberalism sees is that, okay, if power is a constant um, and if a society will always be um, subsumed by power and by rules and by a value system, every society has a value system, um, what value system should it be? And what value system is pro-social? And what value system, for example, uh, would lead to the, um, maybe not the expansion of a, of a society, but at least, uh, at least it have it not die out, for example. You know, like uh, South Korea is uh, subservient to a value system that has it practically consume itself in in lack of reproduction it will those people will not exist in 100 years that that society if it goes that way there will be no south koreans there's you know that's an ex extinction path for a society so whatever it is it would have to enshrine a value or a a hierarchy of of ideas that prevents that just for self-preservation. Um, liberalism cannot produce that hierarchy of values it says you do you you know, <laughs> go, go wild. And, uh, you know, and that should be fine for a society. But if it's, uh, if it's on an extinction path, it's, it's not really fine because it cannot replicate itself. It cannot protect itself. Uh, it, it turns into these purity spirals and these self-hating motifs. Um, yeah, it's, you know, the idea that there has to be, um, there have to be values and what those are is we, we bristle at that idea. It, it just cannot be. So, um, any prescription that will come in uh, is going to be shocking to a lot of people because some values will not make the cut. And 
<laughs> what are you going to do? So I guess uh, that's why localism and like multipolarity and all this type of stuff kind of appeals to the post-liberal thinker because you essentially can have multiplicity of values in a larger value space where if you really are incompatible with the values of culture X, you might be able to, you know, apply to culture B and be part of that culture. Um, how you stop these cultures from entering, you know, endless wars for cultural supremacy, that's another thing. So yeah, these, these are extremely complicated questions. Um, you know, like I said, my, my purpose is to explore these spaces, but uh, I don't think I've, I've heard anyone that I can say, hey, this, this is the new regime. Let's just, you know, roll up our sleeve and start implementing it because it just, this doesn't work that way. Yeah. And you mentioned Ukraine and Russia, and I want to come to that in a minute because I think that's a very interesting dynamic. I'd love to know how a lot of the thinkers or the communities around these ideas have responded to that because it is a kind of a very much kind of return of history, return of reality moment for a lot of people. But before that, just to kind of summarize like why, I'm, why I wanted to, to speak to you about this topic is because one, you're clearly a kind of modern person who has kind of gone through, you, you were in London, you, you've done the kind of, you've seen the, I guess, as you would put it, kind of the emptiness of a lot of kind of modern secular lifestyle firsthand and then gone back to something with more traditional values. And I'd love to hear a bit more about that journey. But also you, you're you a bit more, I think you're more aware of some of the other areas like the Game B conversation and the integral movement and some of those topics. So I'd love to kind of maybe frame how you see those conversations connecting with the neo-reactionary space and where they where they are in relation to each other because they're grappling with a lot of the same questions especially especially something like game b which is which is saying okay this this current system is not sustainable we're looking for something it's a kind of placeholder for some other system um so yeah may, maybe maybe let's start there how do you see these these kind of different parts of the ecosystem relating to each other Yes, I think um, there's a lot of overlap. I feel like there are uh, many people who were interested in Game B, you know, rationalists, people who were interested in uh, effective altruism. Uh, there, The Venn diagrams overlap ca- quite a lot. Uh, you know, it's not a surprise that a lot of people, you know, uh, are became interested in, in neo-reaction after reading the debunking of neo-reaction on Slate Star Codex, which is one of the, the bigger rationalist blogs. So, you know, that's probably the, one of the bigger pipelines into neo-reaction. Uh, so, the same people who are interested in the same kind of big ideas uh, gravitate towards the space. What neo reaction? What sets neo reaction apart is this idea that okay, the liberalism is kind of put to the side. So the the um, the uh, solution space is expanded into that direction. I feel like what's happening in Game B a lot of times are intra liberal fights and. The spaces that I've been in that pertain to Game B tended to kind of devolve into the same SJW, uh, you know, fights whose, you know, colonialism became a, a subject. You know, why aren't there more women in this group? All of these things in Neo Reaction, in these spaces, which are populated mostly by anonymous people, these questions are not posed. These are put completely to the side, and we, we're discussing something else here. Um, is this completely correct? Are there is there nothing interesting in the space that that you know is explored here? Is there you know there, there are things to be said about colonialism, uh, but it it kind of it narrows the space for for true thinking. So um, I think that's why these these corners are a bit more appealing in terms of you know thinking about the the greater questions about okay. How will humanity reproduce? <laughs> How will we go on? Um, I think a lot of people in effective altruism are also interested in, in, in the reaction, but there's also, you know, if you look on Twitter and look at people who um, are into effective altruism, they're typically people who are name face people, you know, that, that have a person, a persona, and they talk about this in, 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 uh, in reality, um, and they put their, themselves out there. Uh, those people typically also have a an anonymous account or they interact with these uh, with these spaces but not uh, not publicly so I think people would be shocked by by how how overlapping these spaces are and how how much these you know these are the same thinkers um, yeah that's that's kind of my feeling being in, in both in both camps mm. yeah because by definition you're talking about people who are wrestling with the question of the fundamental values so yeah, there's going to be a lot of overlap. And 
I'm interested in firstly how much motherhood you think has changed your opinion personally because that's often kind of part of the kind of being mugged by reality dynamic is having children kind of wanting to yeah thinking more about the kind of questions of what kind of world they'll be growing up into and what influences there will be on them and so has that has that been a big part of it for you um i think probably more so in terms of my interest in politics it's, it really has declined a little bit i'm not as um as aggressively researching everything and just i think just my uh involvement with reality is much more important uh, for me right now um i'm still interested in the same questions um i'm probably a little bit more radicalized in some directions like uh for example uh transgender propaganda in in primary school strikes me a little bit more harshly than it used to uh now that i i can just visualize the impact on my own my own children um yeah, so different things affect me in, in different ways. I've become a bit more feminine, which was obviously kind of a, a, a missing dimension to my personality for for a long time. Um, yeah, it's 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 kind of rooted me in in reality much more. Um, it it probably has made me a bit more moderate on some things as well. Um, uh, I mean, I don't know if I could have been less of a neocon before I had children, but now you know the idea of of you know military involvement without a very good reason is probably you know even further from my from my perspective. Not that you know the Romanian army would be a very important uh, ingredient in any sort of conflict, but yeah, it's uh, it's one thing that I'm, I've been considering. I mean, I just I just want to grill. This is the meme on the internet, but that's kind of you know where where I am now as a mother. I would. Politically, to be honest, I would love to explore other questions. I would love for politics not to be this entertainment slash acute interest of everyone, this churning, just, I don't know, endless conversation, hysterical at this point. Uh, we're just moving from hysteria to hysteria. Um, I would kind of love to discuss, you know, philosophy, bigger questions, uh, but it seems that we're constantly being dragged back into into the narrative, into what's going on on, on the daily. Um, I mean, my podcast has a very long lead time. I do tend to um, to to do things in advance. And now I've had to put out a lot of stuff, you know, in, in one or two days just because, you know, Ukraine is happening and then this other thing is happening. And uh, I... I it is what it is, obviously. I don't want to not offer my listeners something interesting, but at the same time, I'd love to be covering the eternal questions and, and things that, uh, that you know, are, are good as good for two months from now as they are today. Uh, but it just seems that reality will not uh, abide my wishes. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, the, uh, my answer is yes, yes, yes and no. Mm. Reality has its own agenda and time scale, it seems. <laughs> exactly. And history is back. Yeah, with a vengeance. And you've talked about the rationalist to traditionalist pipeline. And I'd love to kind of drill a little bit more down into that. My, and I don't know what you make of this. My sense was, so Jordan Peterson, I think, was a really significant, the phenomenon around Jordan Peterson was a very significant thing for an awfully lot, a lot, a lot of people my friend uh, Daniel Thorson said that he kind of broke a conversational seal and you got this sense of like that there, there was something quite extraordinary that happened around that time like 2017 2018 of these kind of the return of some of some of these ideas especially the sort of deep mythological the deep um, religious coming back into into culture and I, what I saw online was a kind of shift between where new atheism had been kind of hegemonic. Like there was a viewpoint of like, what all of this kind of ridiculous religious thinking, we're just kind of purely rational and just looking at science and why would anyone think this? And there was this flip that I saw to saying, hang on, you're ruling out centuries of embodied history, centuries of understanding the world encoded in these mythological structures, you're the idiot. And you got this kind of, it sort of seemed to flip between the two very quickly. And new atheism was shown up to be quite a narrow perspective and a narrow worldview. And in a way, the rationalist to traditionalist seems to me to be a part of that dynamic, because from being sort of like, no, we're purely rational, you then had this extra dimension of, actually, if you're going to be purely rational, you have to accept that there are encoded ways of being, encoded moral frameworks, encoded stories that have survived for centuries, if not millennia, 
And if you're not recognizing that there's some truth in them and using them to inform, to understand why certain behaviors have, have, have maintained, then you're, that's not rational, effectively. So you've got this kind of flip. Do you, do you think that that's, that's part of the story? And if so, how would you reflect on it? Yeah, I think I think you've described it very well. Um, I believe a lot of people uh, tend to discount Jordan Peterson at this point because he's at a kind of a mature point in his career. He's just an extremely high profile person. Um, he's put out most of the ideas that he's had and now he's kind of a, a bit on a downswing. He's not bringing anything new. So it's, it's very easy to say, oh, you know, he's he's a. He's not bringing, uh, he's not uh, like a star intellectual anymore, not bringing new ideas. Um, yes, but like you said, he was probably the first person who could bring a, a high status, new way of thinking uh, into mainstream conversation that wasn't, uh, I don't know, Sam Harris tier, you know, Reddit atheism. That was just, you know, we, uh, there are kind of technocratic ways of solving problems at every level of society. And if the problems aren't solved, it means we just need to bring in a, a better expert with a, a, a more precise solution, with a more rational uh, way of, of solving this. Um, he's brought that into conversation. And also the fact that he had this this huge opus of, of lectures and of analysis that was undeniably interesting and that no one really had uh, thought about, you know, this kind of Jungian perspective, archetypes, mythology, the Bible, uh, you know, things that were, were thrown out of the window in, in, in a matter of, of seconds with, you know, the age of, of the four horsemen and, and Dawkins and, and Hitchens and Harris, um, people that things that you know no one read no one was interested in and that turned out to be filled with this immense richness that was misunderstood up to that point so he he broke open so many things and i i owe him a debt of gratitude as well because i read his works i i probably listened to every second of video he ever recorded i was very much into the the jordan peterson phenomenon um so he kind of opened this this gateway like you said um but then obviously a thousand flowers bloomed and there are other things spun off, you know, fractally from that point. Uh, and I think, yeah, the the movement of rationalists to to traditionalism was a, a for me, obviously these are are names of kind of very wide uh conceptions of the world. Uh, am I a traditionalist in the sense of, I don't know, Alexander Dugan or some, you know, uh I don't know, orthodox monk on the in, in on the mountains of Greece? Probably not. Um, am I more traditionalist than probably most people in central London, the place where I, I came from and, and I, I moved to Romania? Probably yes, yes. So it's it's more of a question of um, of direction rather than okay, this this was my label then and now this is you know this is the lifestyle that I live. So um, what I recognized in in a more traditional lifestyle is um, the fact that, yeah, I think you said it again, you said it, the embodiment, you know, there is a whole conception that as a rational animal, you, um, you analyze the, the field of options around you, uh, you make a decision based on the information that you have, and you rationally pursue your own self-interest. I feel like all of the assumptions behind this are that, you know, there are assumptions, uh, there are we in, uh, in in many ways are not just uh, you know some some homunculus puppeting the meat suit and making rational decisions based on information. We make decisions based on how we feel that day. You know internal proprioception. Um, you know uh, health. Uh, different different sort of visceral feelings. You know embodiment. Um, we are kind of a, a whole and, and, hero and heroic self narratives, which is the other part that exactly, exactly. Yeah. That's that's an important one. You know, even these labels. Okay, am I a traditionalist? Am I a rationalist? Uh, those prompt a certain type of action, a certain type of mindset of how you interact with the world. If you consider yourself a rationalist, you already frame yourself through that metaphor. I'm I am the the maker of choices. I am the homunculus. I, I'm puppeting my meat suit. I can change my meat suit, you know, depending on on the day. I, I might want to upload my consciousness. You know, even the idea that you could upload your consciousness, you know, you have a certain um, feeling about what your consciousness is. And it's probably closer to the meat puppet rather than someone who thinks, okay, I am this almost, you know, kind of this religious mythical being that is embodied, doesn't doesn't essentially understand itself very well, but understands 
um, understands the ways of people up to this point and, you know, bases a lot of trust on those heuristics because they've served people like me very well in the past. So, yeah, I think I think uh, our cultures are kind of at that tension point between those two views of, of what it is to be human. I think the, the rational metaphor has served us really well. Um, you know, it's given us technology. Uh, it is a very limited metaphor up to a point. And I think, you know, the the embodied uh, spiritual creature metaphor also served this very well up to a point. Uh, and I think now what we have to do is kind of balance the tension between these two metaphors and, and how we take the best out of, out of both mindsets. Yeah, you're pointing towards something that I feel very keenly as well, that we're at a kind of the need for synthesis. We've had the, we've had the kind of reaction to the kind of naive liberalism and now, in, for me, in 2022, I think we are in a place of needing, needing a synthetic project more than a kind of, more than just a rebellion. Um, although the rebellion, I think, was absolutely necessary from 2018 onwards, and Jordan Peterson was a big part of that. And I think a lot of the Jordan Peterson phenomenon was riding that wave of um, that kind of insurgency against a naive liberal worldview. And you had sort of using integral language I think you had a kind of pre and a trans version of that. So the, the pre, I think, was something like Trump, sort of, that was kind of a, a, a kind of regressive force against kind of liberalism. And then the, the, the trans, the sort of the, the more steel man version of it, I think was something like, um, included, included some of Jordan Peterson, not all of Jordan Peterson, but, and, and some of the kind of intellectual dark web kind of critiques and some of the post-liberal critiques um and that sort of feels like where we're at now is like okay we, we need a synthetic project yes i i com completely agree with that i i you know my part in this i hope is to widen the space of discussion um you know i try i try to talk to as many people as i can and some of them are quite interesting quite spicy some people that not that many people want to touch um, for now, no one's taken me off the air, but uh, I feel like um, you know these people deserve a, a platform. Uh, they, I think, a, a lot of people expect that. For example, if you have a podcast that you know, if you bring someone on, uh, you endorse everything they say. Um, I that's that's not the case <laughs> at all times, but uh, it's. Um, I think it's it's a useful space to to just yeah to to just open up the the conversation and it's it's. If I mean the podcast space is there to to expose people to to different uh, different idea sets, so yeah, I think it's it's probably the best the best medium to bring people on that are yeah are just interesting in in some ways, even if they're not uh, going to offer all of the solutions or offer all of the uh, the, the clarifications. Mm. And just how how broad do you think this kind of movement of kind of rationalist to traditionalist? has been or is right now mm, how broad is it it's 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 hard because it's um you know you, you see a lot of people moving from the cities to the countryside i mean are these people kind of rationalist to traditionalists probably in part in the sense that they see the value in uh in kind of having a, a home that's not very expensive <laughs> that's one thing probably or um you know the idea of, of working the land having uh having a garden things like that those are those are small things but it seems to be like the pressure is moving that way there's also the fact that you know a lot of uh, a lot of cities you know are there there's you know, dangers involved you know beyond the cost so that's also a pressure point um remote work has also facilitated that so i don't know exactly how many people from this exodus are you know have a um ideological reason or have any reasoning behind it except for uh now i can do this and it's a much more comfortable existence to live in a in a smaller a smaller town or smaller place um and i can't say that that wasn't a, a consideration for me and my husband so yeah that that was a, a big part of it as well um the fact that i had you know ideological ideas <laughs> behind that that's kind of a a plus uh and it just kind of encouraged us to do this more um yeah so it's very hard to see exactly who's in the space. Um, more people are talking about this. Obviously, uh, there is a, a bigger kind of homesteading movement. Uh, localism is a is a big subject. Um, yeah, I mean, these are these. You you can be a a very left wing, very hippie, very liberal, very 
classical liberal type person as well and do these things and see value in these things. Uh, and maybe, for example, just enjoy kind of embodied activities without attaching any sort of value system to it. Um, so, you know, how how heavy this this pipeline is, I don't know. I'm, I was part of it. But uh, yeah, <laughs> who knows? Mm. And yeah, I want to uh, talk a little bit about uh, Ukraine, Russia, because part of part of I think you when we talked before, you described um, the center of neo reactionary or some of the thinkers within it saying, like, what we need is based Caesar. And obviously, Putin had been a kind of big uh, go as far as to say, like a role model for some of the the people within that space. Now that what's ha- now that we've seen what happened with Ukraine, Russia, it feels like there's been a a lot of rifts in in a lot of different places over what's been going on, um, particularly in the kind of contrarian space where where I think it's it's increasingly difficult to take a a really hard contrarian perspective without kind of it just being indistinguishable from Russian propaganda. Um, and I, I wonder what. Have you seen any rifts within the kind of broader uh, near reactionary space over this, or has it been largely supportive of Russia? Um, there are rifts, depending on um, kind of what how how you see the the events unfolding. Uh, because if you take the position of um, kind of Ukrainian independence as being uh, you know, kind of Zelensky as as the local based Caesar. Um, also, there are quite, there's quite uh, you know serious right wing energies developing now in 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 the midst of this and kind of uh, Ukrainian separatism being part of that. Um, a lot of people tend to identify with Ukraine in that sense. Um, then there are kind of the the, the older school uh, kind of neo reactionary thinkers would probably say, okay, you know, Russia is protecting its um, its imperial status, its empire building, uh, it is developing its, you know, as part of the multipolar order. Um, so, you know, there there are different ways to 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 take uh, a position here. Um, I think that's kind of probably the major split within kind of the the post liberal neo reactionary idea. I don't think there is a not many people are bristling at the idea that you know countries have geopolitical interests um, that. Um, you know, war is something that should never happen. Um, you know, there's a certain understanding that war is part of human nature. It tends to break out oh, even over, you know, very superficial ideas. Um, I think there is an, an interesting aspect to what's going on in kind of the post-liberal new reactionary space is that a lot of people are a bit more open to understanding what exactly has happened uh, in the sense that, you know, they're reading the the Putin speeches. They're, they're looking into, you know, what information is coming out of Russia, um, you know, be it propaganda, be it not propaganda. There's a lot of propaganda on the Ukrainian side as well. You know, there's the, the information uh, ecosystem at this point is just so maddening that, uh, you know, any sort of piece of information that you gather from social media is is pretty is pretty likely to be at least used for propaganda purposes rather than, you know, it's, it doesn't have to be made up. It's just, for example, you know, if you have a, a picture of, uh, you know, some someone suffering, uh, that and if that picture is amplified by every outlet, uh, you know, it, it does seem like the suffering is preponderantly on one side. Um, so yeah, it's a it's it's a very complicated um, yeah in, information ecosystem to to navigate at this point. Uh, my my personal opinion on 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 the the conflict is that um, this these are for, not not for a little reason. You know these these states of of which I am part as well. I'm in Romania right now. These have been vassal states. These are vassal states because they're at the intersection of empires. Um, is it better for Romania to be a vassal of the EU uh, US system? Yes, probably at this point. Um, is the EU US system slowly crumbling, kind of consuming itself, which is something I document as well? Yes. Will it crumble in the next 10, 15, 20 years? Well, it depends very much. This is what we're betting on. You know, who who is ascendant? Who is on the upswing? Will Russia ally with China? Will that be an extremely important 
advantage to Russia, which it seems that it might have to now because if the um, trade routes with the EU dry up, uh, it might have to ally with China and strengthen each other's position uh, because I don't see the US uh, putting the same types of sanctions on China because that would actually be the the end of the, the global trade system. So, uh, you know, predicting, you know, who is is going to win and how fast is um, is essentially the best strategy for a country in this region. So is it good that, you know, Romania might be in the sphere of the influence of, of Russia in, in 20, 30 years? It very much depends what Russia is going to look like in, in 20, 30 years. And people are making different bets on this. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't, if I wasn't a documentarian of the decline of the West, I would probably say, oh, you know, forever will I want to be a, a vassal state of, of the uh, EU uh, US complex. But but who knows? <laughs> really, really, who knows? So it's it's a, it's a very strange, um, yeah, it's, it's a very strange time to live in, especially because we don't like the Russians, really. Anyone you ask here, it's, it's not like, you know, there's any affinity. We're not Russian. Uh, we've only had bad interactions with them. You know, even my family lore is, is littered with, with absolutely terrible uh, stories about the Red Army and, uh, and the life under communism of, of very serious Soviet influence, even, even though we weren't part of the Union proper. Um, yes, yeah, so it's... It, it is a, a, a big question. What what is good for these countries in the long run? But complete independence from spheres of influence, either Western or Eastern, is impossible in this area, and it will always be impossible. And I feel like a lot of people don't understand that. Uh, so yeah, that's that's my <laughs> two cents on it. Yeah, and as I was thinking about the, this conversation this morning, I was I went on a little bit of a train of thought about this sort of this sort of obviously fundamental dichotomy between kind of left and right liberal and conservative and the liberal side tends to have a kind of quite over optimistic view of human nature going back to rousseau going back to the idea that society is the problem people are basically good and on the other side conservatives tend to have a much more probably a more realistic view of human nature maybe a more pessimistic view of human nature that we're essentially flawed we need these systems to keep our worst in instincts in check and I would, and I was kind of trying to wonder, like, where where do I fit on that? I, I'd agree with, like, I think conservatism has a more sophisticated understanding of human nature. I think um, even the the kind of religious mindset and the idea of like the problem of good and evil, I think, is another kind of is a is a really valuable, as someone like Jordan Peterson frames it, a sort of psychological reality. But I also, like, I feel like if, if I can be somewhere in the middle. My kind of belief system is also based on a lot of the post personal growth work that I've done. Like, I, I do think that we don't change easily. Like the conservative idea that people don't really change um, what, versus the liberal idea that, oh, if you only removed all of the restrictions to people, that things would be different. I think both of them are wrong. But my sort of sense is that real change for people or for cultures or for society is a much deeper thing than throwing money at the problem. It's kind of looking at people's kind of why people have the um, beliefs they do, why people have the self-image they do. That's why things like poverty are very difficult to alleviate with intervention. But I do have that sense of like change is possible. And I and I mention that because I know we've got a sort of, we've, we've both done some of the same kind of personal growth work. And I don't know whether that has influenced your belief system as well. But I guess what I'm reaching towards is that I do think there are that if we're looking at kind of the what's next space, the solution space for some of the problems, the cultural issues we're looking at, for me, it's tied into personal growth. It's tied into a deeper psychological understanding of what keeps us stuck, uh, of what the kind of the root cause of so many of the social problems is. And I and I don't know what that looks like, but I, if I was kind of to to kind of try and express my my perspectives on on how I see the world and what I see the solution space being, it would be something like that. Mm -hmm. No, I, I see what you mean. Um, I think kind of my reservation here would be that people who gravitate towards personal growth work are kind of self-selecting a little bit. Uh, so, you know, maybe they sense that there is a, a an opportunity space around them there. There are places to pivot uh, towards that, you know, maybe other people just don't don't want to consider or are, are stuck in other ways. Um, I do think people can change. Um, uh, I also think that 
if you're looking at a, um, a social system, a political system, you kind of have to um, make, um, you have to create it for, in a way, the, not just the lowest common denominator, but the worst case scenario. So if you, um, if you have extremely um, positive expectations of what someone might do, you are going to connect, create a very, you know, lax uh, scenario. You're probably not going to, um, you know, try to enforce many things because you're like, okay, you know, people are basically good. You just want to unshackle them from the things that might turn them bad. Uh, but if if the situation is that, you know, people are not basically bad, but, you know, that if, if certain incentives are present, people will take advantage of them, and which is essentially kind of the conservative position. You want to create a system that will um, protect other people from the externalities of, of those actions. So even though you, you want to maintain as much freedom as possible for the individual by protecting other people from the likely actions of an individual that is freed, but you know, not freed to the point where they can inflict massive, massive harm on other people. So I guess that's kind of the the conservative position. Um, how my uh, my personal growth work has impacted this. Um, I, I probably have become a bit more open to the idea of of change and and growth. But again, this is you know at at a personal level. I'm not sure that the political uh, can reflect that level. You know, you kind of have to have the initiative and the the will and you kind of have to put yourself through those uh, those changes and i think they they've been very positive for for myself and my family and the people around me um you know how how that reflects at a political level i don't know maybe the fact that i've i've started this podcast and i'm inviting all these kind of political type thinkers maybe that's kind of an, an externality um I don't know if I would have started this podcast or done a lot of um work to put myself out there if I didn't go through personal you know, personal growth work and stuff. So I, it's very hard to to think of a, a counterfactual, but I think it has opened me up a little bit more to people, and I don't know, made me a bit more relaxed about uh, how I appear to others, and you know, just uh, just being in the wider world. Yes, yeah, so that's that's kind of the impact on me. Mm. Yeah, and something else sparked by what you said before about the the need for. A kind of realistic view of human nature, I guess. And the other, the other thing that ties to what I was saying before is the kind of the sense that something needs to go in the space left by religion. Like this, this has been a huge conversation on on Rebel Wisdom. A lot of the people we've hosted have talked about this. Uh, John Bavaki talks about the religion that's not a religion, and recognizing how many different layer, layers there are to religion that you have the thou shalt not like what religion does as a kind of as a coordination system in society is like you're all headed in a certain direction you've got a certain value system but you also have a very clever developmental system where depending on where you are like you have these you have these kind of restrictions on behavior at the lower levels of kind of the 10 commandments if you don't do this you do this but then at the higher levels you've got kind of the much more sophisticated descriptions of good and evil of the problem of, of, of the reality of grace of all of these kind of higher kind of spiritual dimensions so i think there's something in that as well that what we actually what we what we need quite clearly for me is something that at least was in the place of religion whether that's and then when you actually look at what a religion does and what a religion has done throughout history and you realize what a immense sophisticated piece of um a piece of work each of them is you realize like what a huge job that would be to 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 find something that would replace it and do all of those different jobs but i guess that's also kind of like connected to the personal growth piece because any good religion will also have practices within it that are designed to make us better people they're designed to help us look at our uh where we've where we've gone off track or how we can develop better relationships with people about all of these different sort of what Viveki would call psychotechnologies for, 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 yeah, set for growth. Um, so I guess that's, a, that's another piece that I'm sure you've, you've wrestled with as well. Yes, absolutely. And it's, um, it is, it is a huge vacuum. I feel like a lot of people don't understand how, how huge the, 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 the lack is. And we've seen this vacuum, you know, kind of wokeness, what we call wokeness is rushing to fill this vacuum. Um, and uh, it, it does fulfill a lot of, you know, the, the utopian function, the idea that, you know, there is uh 
Um, there is a, a shining uh, city on the hill where we won't have all of these soul dysfunctions like racism and sexism and all this type of stuff. Um, so it, it, it does that, but unfortunately it, it doesn't really have the, uh, the other incredibly important functions of, um, of offering um, redemption, of, of offering improvement, uh, of offering kind of a, a, a realistic mechanism of getting better. It just offers kind of the, the Salem witch hunt aspect of, of religion uh, and the, the righteousness that comes with, you know, finding the, the heretic and, and pointing them out. And, you know, it's also enabled by uh, a lot of technology because, you know, it's never been easier to, to you know, ferret out the, the heretic and, and, and point them out without any sort of personal cost. So all of these things kind of flow into the fact that, you know, this is a, a very powerful moral system that's, it's not surprising that it's taking over the West. Um, the, the big question is, like you said, you know, what can come after it? What can compete with it? Um, is it, will it be um, classical, you know, religion as we know it? It's, it's pretty hard, you know, religion still on, on decline. Some religions are on the upswing, but that's mostly kind of a, a demographic uh, situation. But the idea that we're not going to have kind of like a Catholic integralist state or, uh, I don't know, Protestantism is going to be back with a vengeance. I really don't, don't see that. So um, we're probably looking at a world that is going to be, you know, more and more fractured mimetic tribes with their own value systems, um, you know, to trying to outcompete each other and, uh, and, and gain more followers <laughs> from one another, you know, literally and, and in the social media sense. So, um, yes, I'm, I'm very curious what's going to come next. I mean, I'm, I'm personally have gravitated towards, you know, more old school religion, but uh, I, I don't see that being a very massive trend outside of, you know, very, very online spaces. Mm. Yeah, you mentioned like wokeness is one of those things that has kind of taken up that religious space. And so many other like QAnon on the other side, I think, has taken up the is another kind of religion. And that's one of the kind of fundamental frames that we look at the world or rebel wisdom looks at the world is like we're seeing religious phenomenon that we had not identified as religious phenomenon in the past. And in a way, new atheism was one of those as well. Like it was it was kind of a, a a, re a religious system uh fundamentalism it was sort of a, a kind of fundamentalism not recognizing it as such itself as such before um yeah yeah let, let let's see i mean th this is one of this is the biggest question and people like jonathan pajot or paul van der clay and john bavaki are really wrestling with it at the moment it's like is it possible that something new could go in that space or do we need some kind of reboot like it, is it remotely possible that Christianity could be rebooted? Like these are these are huge questions. Yes, I it's, it's that's that's one of my my major areas of interest as well. Um, you know, even personally, it's been very hard to reboot Christianity, even for myself. You know, I still almost have kind of the the rationalist frame on top of it. You know, I I see it in a quite fairly. Um, instrumentalized way i wish i didn't but you know i'm i'm a christian because you know what else is there which is not essentially you know the result of an epiphany I'm, i've not been you know uh, visited by by any sort of uh, revelation um so it's i think it's it's a it's a hard um hard thing to to promote to to people nowadays but also uh, a lot of um christian revival was motivated historically by uh times of great need and i feel like with history returning and inflation being what it is and you know things slowly declining in, in many directions it's sad to say that it might be that people will turn to religion because of uh, of, of situations in the real world of, of actual need of need you know where when you need your fellow man when you can't rely on uh, on uber eats to, to to feed for to feed you then it might be uh you know it might be the time to uh to to resurrect these these old school ideas have you hosted Paul Kings North? Yes, yes, I have. Mm, yeah, he's he's another of these fascinating characters, like like yourself, who have have been thoroughly modern, have gone through that sort of thoroughly modern um, trajectory, and then ended up in a very traditionalist place, which I find a really fascinating. I, I don't I don't know if it's yeah I I, I don't know if it's right. I don't know if it's right for me, but it certainly is interesting to see that a lot of people have kind of ended up in a very similar place. 
Yes, and it it is um you know it's it it is partly LARPing you know because a lot of people ask uh, this question you know is it is it is it valid if it is a LARP uh, in the LARP in the sense of you know live live action role playing uh, you were just kind of pretending putting on this uh, the 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 garb of someone who's a traditionalist but you know we're we're essentially liberals and, and modernists to the core uh, that's true uh, but at the same time what wouldn't be a LARP like t- today if, for example if you go to 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 the gym uh, to lift weight <laughs> that is essentially probably one of the most larpiest things that you can do i mean you're not necessarily using your your body for productive labor you're just uh you're lifting you know absurd things and then putting them down it, it is it, it's it's nuts but it's still good for you uh you should probably do it uh and so is you know trying to do all of these embodied things you know working in a garden maybe doing work around the homestead and things like that very larpy very crazy you don't need to do these things you could just go to the city get a job get your food delivered uh you, you don't need to um kind of everything's mediated by by other other people you can you know you can live comfortably exerting minimal minimal effort which is what your body is supposed to do essentially if you weren't larping at all um but i feel like we're at the point you know where, where our system has created enough abundance in the sense of food and shelter and things like that that we have to larp to stay alive so you know i i kind of embrace my my larping uh i i add to it i admit it uh and i think that maybe people should should larp more mm. larp it till you make it exactly <laughs> cool alex this was fascinating really interesting and i'm uh yeah really glad that we made the time to to catch up as we've been threatening to do for quite a long time now Thank you so much, David. I'm, I'm a big fan of the channel. I'm, I love your work and uh, I'm happy that uh, I got to come on. <laughs>